We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in to one of ACC's messages. As you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're on social media, use the hashtag you belong at ACC if God taught you anything during this message. We want to get to know you. So check out our online community by watching our live service at arundelcc.org live. This is where you can interact with other viewers in the chat, fill out a prayer request, and follow along with message notes. And we believe that God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, good morning, church. Welcome to the jungle, right? Doesn't the church look amazing? I, I've been amazed every single time I've walked in here. If you think this waterfall looks cool, wait until you see it on. Seriously. It's pretty, pretty cool. Uh, it's, it's pretty amazing what's happening around this church. And so we're going to have a really great time starting tomorrow with our Kid Venture Week. I believe we still have 25 spots available. So if you know someone who would like to participate, it's not too late to register. We've got 25 slots available, so make sure you do that. Uh, it's going to be an amazing, amazing week. Hey, before we get into my message this morning, I wanted to take a chance and pray with you. Uh, I know yesterday was a, a, a weird day in our country when you see an assassination attempt on uh, someone running for the, pretty much the highest probably office in the land, um, it's got to pause, make you pause and wonder what kind of world we live in. And so let's just take a moment as a church and pray for what's happening outside of these walls. And, uh, and, and will you join me? God, we thank you so much for being a God of order. We know that because of sin, we live in a world of chaos and disorder. Would you allow us to be a church that that seeks to love, that seeks to uh, find places where we can unify with each other and, and help to spread your love and goodness in a very dark world. God, we're asking that you help us to be light in a place where people are struggling in darkness. Would you help us to, to shine and, and bring truth into chaos? Father, right now we lift up um, political parties on all sides and the candidates, President Trump and his a quick healing. We lift up President Biden and we ask for their protection as they're going through this process. God, we ask that you'd help us to be a, a congregation, a body of believers that points people never to, we, we recognize that you are in charge of life. You decide when to take it. And so would you always help us to point people to, to understanding the dignity and sanctity of life that all humans have been made in your image God, would you provide quick healing for those that were injured, and uh, would you just provide peace for the family that lost a loved one yesterday? Uh, we, uh, we love you, and we thank you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, uh, you know, we're in our series called Unshakables, and if you're not sure what that means, because this is maybe a first Sunday with us, we're taking time as a church to go through some key elements of what it means to be a Christian. What are like the unshakable things, the essentials of the Christian faith that we're not willing to budge on? These aren't like the unessential matters that we can have some disagreements. These are like the, the solid matters that all of us should be able to say, let's lock arms on this. This is what the Bible says. And so this week, we're going to talk about sin and salvation. Remember, we ended with a bunch of bad news last week, and I said, make sure you come here this week because you're going to get the good news. Well, the sin part is kind of the overlap. We talked about sin last week and how sin separates us from God. Today, we're going to talk about sin a little bit more because we have to understand the bad news fully before we can embrace and accept the good news. And so we're going to talk about sin for a little bit and salvation for a lot of bit, okay? And so here, here's what I got. Uh, we're going to talk about sin just for a moment. If you're wondering what is sin, in the simplest terms, it's actually a word that comes from an archery term. Uh, it, it, the word sin is an archery term. It means missing the mark. Simply put, it's any time you do something or you don't do something or you think something that's outside of God's perfect plan, you miss the mark. We call that sin. Uh, here's how we write, uh, write it on our website. It says, we believe that sin is any action in action or attitude that is contrary to the nature or word of God, which constitutes a rejection of his authority resulting in alienation from God. That's what sin is. Now, I wrote down five things I want you to know about sin real quick. I'm going to go through these like rapid fire. I'll be done in like a minute, okay? The first thing I want you to know about sin is that sin entered into our world 
through Adam and Eve in the original fall, right? When they, they, they grabbed from the tree they shouldn't have, they ate from the tree that God told them not to eat from, sin entered into our experience, and now all of us have this sin nature that we've inherited from Adam and Eve. That's where sin entered into our story. The second thing I want you to know about sin is that God hates sin. Now, God is known for his love. God loves people made in his image, but he hates the sin that we commit. He hates sin. Another thing I want you to know about sin is that God alone is the source of deciding what is sin and what is not sin. And he reveals that to us in his word. We get to know what is right in the eyes of God and what is wrong in the eyes of God by what he alone reveals in his word. You don't get to decide for yourself. You don't get to decide, you know what, this is just makes me feel good or I'm okay with it, so God must be okay with it. That's not how it works. If God's word says that something is wrong, that it's missing the mark, then we call that sin. God alone decides. All right, number four thing I want you to know about sin is that if you are a follower of Christ— Meaning you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, the power of the Holy Spirit, the same power that allowed Jesus to conquer death, you have that inside of you. So guess what? As a follower of Jesus, you have the power inside of you to avoid sin. You do have a sin nature. You have a part of you that you inherited from Adam that's constantly trying to go away from and and bending away from God's good plan. But you have the power in you to straighten up. You have the ability to do what is good and what is right. Now, I get it. All of us still struggle to do what is good and right, but guess what? We have the power within us to do it. Another thing that God's Word teaches us, the fifth thing I want to say quickly, is that, the, that we, we have to recognize that the penalty for our sin is death. Eternal separation from God. That is the punishment that every single one of us in this room deserves because of the sin that all of us have committed. We are all sinners. We all deserve death. You've got to understand your need before you can understand the, the, the joy, the good news of, of, the, of salvation. All right, so we got all that. So now we're going to transition into a, what does this church believe about salvation? And we're going to look at salvation from four different perspectives. We're going to look at, uh, we're going to look at it from a perspective of the need of salvation. We're going to look at it from the, the means of salvation. You know, how, how is salvation even available to us? We're going to look at the mode of salvation. How, what does someone have to do to actually be saved? And number four, what is our response once we have been saved? So we're going to look at salvation from those four perspectives. But first... We're going to put up on the screen our essential statement, our big idea statement, and I want you guys to read this with me. Now, first service, I challenged them. I told them that last week you guys were louder than they were, and they got really loud this morning to over, over, you know, to say it this louder than you, but I I know this service. I know you guys can do it. Ready? Let's read this big idea statement together. All right, we believe that all humanity willfully rebelled and sinned against God and is therefore separated from him as a result. Thankfully, though, the forgiveness of sins is available to all who accept the sacrifice of Jesus, repent from their sin, and claim Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Salvation is a free gift, not the result of human works, bestowed by God's grace and received by faith in Christ alone. The Bible commands every believer in Christ to be baptized by immersion as their first step of obedience and to share this gospel with those outside of faith in Christ. Who's with me so far? You guys good on that? All right. Now, if you're in this room and you're like, hey, I'm not sure I'm with you on that. I got some questions. Well, you're in the right spot because we're going to go through this statement today. We're gonna, again, we're going to talk about the need, the means, the mode, and the response to salvation. And so all of us should be able to walk out of here today kind of on the same page about what God's Word says about salvation. So let's start with the first point, our need for salvation. Every one of us in this room, we have a need to be saved. We are all uh, Remember, our penalty for sin is this thing called death. So all of us, that's, that's what we got coming, right? It says on, on our website, 
when you look at sin, our, our belief about sin, it says the penalty for sin is physical and spiritual death. It says Adam, uh, uh, physical and spiritual death. In other words, eternal separation from God. Uh, here, here's how it, it reads in Romans 5, 12. It says, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death. And so death spread to everyone for everyone has sinned. You're going to hear this word death a lot because ultimately that's the consequence for our sin. All of us deserve because of our sin to be separated from God. And so that means a physical death and a spiritual death, eternal separation from God. That is the consequence. Have you ever heard someone before? Maybe they, they did something and they they kind of uh, did something really risky, and when they were all done with it, they, they looked and they're like, oh my goodness, Whew, I almost died. Or they, they say, I, 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 I could have died. Listen, here's the point. Uh, when someone says that, you just look at them saying, listen, you are, at one point in your life, you are going to die, right? I, I, I almost died. Well, yeah, you may, or maybe you almost died then, but at some point, we're all gonna die. It's, it's coming for all of us. Why? Because the Bible says that we all need to be saved. We all have this thing called death that's coming to us because of our sin. All of us experience that together. It's part of the human experience. Have you ever wondered, like, if God really is all-loving and he's really all-powerful, why couldn't he have just made it so that sin wasn't a thing? Why, you know, why did he even have to put the tree in the garden to start with? He could have just created us saying, I love you all. I don't want you to ever uh, falter or have some other problems or trial in your life. And because I'm so all loving and so all knowing and so all powerful, I'm just going to make it so that we all live happily ever after. Why didn't God do that? That seems like a, maybe an easier way to go about having a relationship with us. But the truth is, and we all understand this logically, Remember, love isn't love unless it's freely given. If God had programmed you to love him, in other words, if you had no choice but to love him, would that be real love? It wouldn't. It would have just been programmed into you. And so God wanted a relationship with you. He chose to love you. And so in order to give you an opportunity to choose to love him, he had to put a choice in the garden. He had to put a tree. And all of us had a choice. Adam had a choice. Do you, Adam and Eve, do you guys want to do things your way, then eat from the tree, or do you want to do things God's way? He says, don't eat from the tree. And what did they choose? They chose to do things their way. And sin entered into our experience. All of us inherited this from Adam and Eve. All of us have this sin nature now. All of us on our own, we choose constantly to do things our own way instead of choosing to do things God's way. You see, we're desperately in need of someone to save us from the consequences of our sin. That's what the Bible teaches us. It says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. The wages, I love that word. You remember, who here remembers their first job? First job you ever had. You remember even better than that, the first paycheck you remember how excited you were to grab that check and you open up that envelope and you pull that check out and you look at it and you're like, wait, what? <laughs> like that, that's it? Right, and then you look at it and you realize a bunch of other people have had their hands in your money. You're like, who's, who's this and why are they taking some? Who, what's Social Security and what's that? What's the state wants some? You know, you're seeing all these people take part of it and, and you you, you experience this first paycheck, right? The wages of your work, and here it is, and now you get to go, and it's not usually that much, but you get to go spend it. It's yours. Well, the Bible says that the wages for your sin, when you open up that envelope at the end of your life to see what it is that you've earned, how much money you made, you know, what it is that's on the check, it simply says you deserve death because of your sin. doesn't matter how much or how, how little. The wages of our sin is death. Another way to think about this is that heaven has very rigorous admission standards. 
we're talking like it's harder to get into heaven than it is to get into Harvard, right? It's, it's very stringent, all right? All you got to do to be able to meet the requirements to get into heaven is to be perfect, That's it. That's the admission requirement to get into heaven. You have to have a completely clean record with no sin. And the Bible just said that all of us are guilty of sin. So we got ourselves into a need. We got ourselves into a problem. In other words, we're all stuck on the wrong side of a ravine. We're on one side. God's on the other. Because of our sin, he's perfect. He hates sin. In him, there is no darkness. We're over here in this broken world, and we all have our own darkness. And so we're separated from him desperately in need of salvation. Now, nod your head with me. Do you all recognize we have a need for salvation? All right. Let's look at number two. Our means of salvation. How is salvation available to us? Is there a way to get from one side of the ravine to the other? Because I'm imperfect and God is perfect. How can this be made right? It says in, in God's word that he loves you so much that, he, that God the Father chose to send God the Son. Jesus Christ came to this earth to bridge the ravine for you. That through Jesus Christ, you have the ability to go from death into life. But the problem is that we still have this sin issue. You still are not perfect. And remember, the admission requirements to get into heaven is perfection. So we still got a problem. We got a bridge, but somehow this bridge has to fix this, this sin problem. And it's this, this concept in theology called the great substitution. Let me explain the great substitution to you. I have a, a visual picture we're going to use in just a moment to really understand this. How many of you, by the way, when you go to a restaurant and you order something, you're one of those people that substitutes just about everything. You're like, hey, instead of fries, I want some tots, right? And can you uh, take off the onions and add some pickles? And you're just like substituting. How many of you are like substitutors, right? When people are ordering with you, it's kind of embarrassing because the waiter's got to write a whole page just for you, right? And they're like, okay, not this, not that. Uh, well, that's not what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the great substitution. I'm not talking about your order at glory days, okay? I'm talking about something greater than that where one thing is swapped out for another thing. You see, all of us, we are responsible for, we've done the crime, and so we got to do the time. We're all responsible to pay for our sin. But, but God creates this method, this, this great substitution, where he says, listen, if there's someone out there who doesn't have their own crime to pay for, and they're willing to step into your place. I'll, I'll substitute the punishment, the justice that's coming to you. I'll, I'll give the punishment to them, and you can swap places with them. In fact, let me show this to you with an illustration. I need some volunteers to join me on stage to really make this make sense. Uh, anyone willing to come up on stage for this illustration? All right, come on up. Mike, come on up. Oh, you, you come up too. Yeah, there, 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 right, there we go. I right, got three volunteers. Can you guys uh, thank my volunteers for being <laughs> courageous? All right. Or I'm going to have you stand on this side. Okay. Remind me your name. Ashley. Ashley and Mike. Ashlyn. Aurora, Ashlyn, and Mike. Thank you for being here. All right. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give each of you one of these. Don't open it up. All right. Uh, just hang on to that for just a moment. Uh, what you are holding in your hands right now, these are their rap sheets. You know what a rap sheet is, right? When you're like in trouble with the law, you, they're going to run you and they're going to see like here's all the things, or here's all the speeding tickets and here's all the times you've been in jail and here's the, the debts you owe. And you've got a rap sheet. All of us got a rap sheet. Well, when it comes to our eternal picture in heaven, God understands everything you've ever done that is outside of his perfect plan for you. We all have a rap sheet. We have sin that separates us from God. And so what I'm going to do, with your permission, I'm going to open up your rap sheet, okay? And we're going to look at it. All right, so here we go. Aurora um, in here. So we got got this rap sheet, a nice little silhouette of you here. Uh, Dishonoring parents, okay, pride. Hey, you know what? One sheet 
Huh? <laughs> Pretty good. All right, you hang on to that. But here's the problem, though. Your, you, your rap sheet isn't really that long, but just one thing on here separates you from Jesus for eternity because he's perfect. In him, there is no darkness. And, if, and it's not a ton of stuff in here, but if you try to get into heaven with this rap sheet, you're going to, the admissions requirements are pretty strict. You're not going to be able to do it. All right, Ashley, let's see what we got. All right. So we open up your rap sheet in here, and we got um, stealing. Uh-oh. We got some pages in here, Ashlyn. We got some greed, dishonoring parents, lust, some false worship. All right. I, man, I'm not going to go into detail here. But you got some stuff in here that separates you from God for eternity. This is your rap sheet. You're responsible for it, right? So hang on to that. All right, Mike, let's see what we got. Okay. (laughs) Brother. (laughs) Yeah, okay, well, I I don't think I need to go into all these. Um, There's a lot of stuff on here. Have you, you, you know, there's, there's another rap sheet, though, I'm holding. Will you hold on to this? Just, that, that's yours. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, they don't want this anywhere near them. All right, you, you hang on to that. So I got another rap sheet here, and it's labeled really clearly, Jesus. So here's the beautiful thing about Jesus' rap sheet. He, he lived a perfect life. There's no sin on this rap sheet. There's nothing. It's a blank sheet of paper. It's pure. It's white. It's it's blank. And what Jesus does in this great substitution is he simply says, listen, if you want, now I'm going to give you guys the option. It's a free choice. Imagine walking to a courthouse and you got a rap sheet and you have to stand before a judge. And before you go in, your lawyer comes to you and says, listen, if you'd like, you can swap out your rap sheet for this one. Now, yours has to go in here. Someone's still got to pay for your sin. It still requires death. It's still going to require blood. It's going to require someone to, it, it's going to, we still need justice. But how many of you would like to swap out? Would you like to swap out? Right, open up your pen. <laughs> here, open up and let's, uh, let's take yours out. You know, Jesus is going to take care of that for you. All right, so here's, you put Jesus' rap sheet in there. All right, you want one of Jesus's? Oh, yeah. yeah, all right. Sure, sure. Let's take, yeah, get, get rid of all those. That's right. Yeah, all right, you swap that out. Okay. Let's open up yours too. <laughs> we got we to gotta, we gotta unpin it. All right, Jesus will take care of it. It just got a lot lighter, didn't it? Yeah. I mean, that. Now, what Jesus does is he takes your sin all the, the junk that we bring in. And he says, listen, I, if, if you'd like, you don't have to fold it up. Uh, if you'd like, I'm going to take care of all this on the cross on your behalf. If you let me. Now, what, here's what I want to do. I think this is really powerful. If you guys would open up your rap sheets. I know each of you enough that you've already made a decision to swap out your rap sheets. This is your rap sheet right now. You might try to add stuff accidentally. To later today, you're going to do something and you're going to add something, but it's going to go onto this rap sheet. This is your rap sheet. One day you're going to stand before God and this is what he's going to see. And now as you're holding that out in front of you, you can hold it out for everyone to see or you can hold down and look at that blank sheet of paper. I want to read some scripture to you. It says in Isaiah 53 verse 6, all of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own, yet the Lord laid all of our sins, laid on Jesus the sins of us all. And so there's our sins there in his rap sheet. And you guys are hanging on to those ones. How about this one? Romans 3, 23 says, for everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard, yet God, in his grace, freely made us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sin. 
How about Romans 5? It says, therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place, ready for this, of undeserved privilege. Where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing in God's glory. Now before you go, I got two more verses to share with you. I want you to know that something had to happen for you to be able to receive this substitution. It didn't just happen. Now, you, Jesus didn't just say, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll take your sin. He had to pay for it with his blood. The Bible talks about the power of the blood of Jesus in making this system of substitution possible. There, there needed to be the shedding of blood. There needed to be death of a spotless lamb. Here it says in 1 Peter 1, it says, for you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Jesus, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. In Romans 5, 9, it says, And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. And so now listen, because this is your rap sheet, you have the ability to, to go across the ravine through Jesus. Jesus is the only way back to the Father. And when Jesus looks at you, when God looks at you coming into his holy kingdom forever, he's going to see the requirements have been met to be in Jesus' presence. You have perfection now because of Christ's atoning work, substituting work on the cross. Can you guys thank them for me? Thank you. Now, I, I know Mike kind of well, but I, I don't know what your childhood was like, so maybe, maybe this is, I don't. Okay, let's talk about the mode of salvation. That's a really big question. I think all of us would say, all right, I get it, I need it, and I recognize that it's available to me because of Jesus' substitutionary work on the cross, I get it, but how do I step into the saving grace of God? How do I start this relationship? How do I get salvation? The mode of salvation. Let's, let me read some scriptures to you and confuse you a little bit. You ready? <laughs> Acts 2 verse 38 tells us how to do it. It says, Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized. In the name of uh, Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. All right, Acts 3.19 puts it a little differently. It says, now repent of your sins and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped away. How about Romans 10? It puts it a little differently. It says, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I don't know about you, but I read verses like this, and I'm like, there's a lot of different verbs. Which verbs do I need to pay attention to? I see that I need to declare. Uh, some verses say I need to believe. Some verses say I need to confess. Some verses say I need to repent. Another verse says I need to turn. Some verses say I need to be baptized. And so I'm sitting here thinking, well, what do I got to do? I want to make sure I do it. Would you just tell us what is it? Now, I get it. It can be really complicated, and I have an illustration I think that'll make this make sense. There's times as a pastor where one of my, the favorite parts of my job is when I get to, to stand with a, a groom and a bride on the stage, and I get to help walk a couple through the process of a marriage. It's beautiful. It's a wonderful thing. And I want you to think about this for a second. In the process of a marriage, at what point does the couple become officially married? I bet if I asked you to think about it, you'd all come up with a slightly different answer. Some of you would say, well, it's the, the moment that they've they made a decision that they wanted to spend the rest of their life together. The marriage happens even before they walk down the aisle. Some people would say, no, it's the moment the father gives his, his daughter away to be married, and there's, a, there's something there, and now they're... 
Some would say, no, it's the moment of the vows, right? It's when the bride says, I, I promise this, and the groom says, well, I promise this. And at that moment, they verbally declared a promise, and they're, they're married in the eyes of God, right there in that moment. Some people would say, no, it's at, the, it's at that kiss. The kiss is when it's official. Or some people would say, no, it's when the pastor has to say the words, I now declare you. And maybe it's just the words of the pastor that, that in that moment, something supernatural happens and you have a wedding, boom, marriage. Some people would say, no, it happens after the wedding when the pastor signs this document and then he puts it in an envelope and he sends it off to the state and then it, that signature makes it official. Now, some people would argue, no, it's not even official until later that night, right? When the wedding is co consummated, that's when you're officially married. Up until that point, legally, right, you can annul this whole thing. Have you consummated it yet? Nope. All right, we can annul this. So the question is, at what point in this very important decision is the marriage official? And some of you would be like, I, I, I think maybe this one or someone else would be like, well, maybe that one. In, in fact, put it this way. What if as a pastor, I forget one of the steps? It's happened. Hey, I forgot to say the words, I now declare you man and wife. I skip right to you, may now kiss the bride. I now present to you. And they walk off. Am I like, oh, hold on, hold on. I forgot you guys aren't actually married. No, or, or what if I forget to sign the document that I'm supposed to send to the state? That's happened before. <laughs> What if the, the night of the, the wedding, right? They're off on the honeymoon suite and they're exhausted or something's just not working quite right. And the, 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 the marriage isn't actually consummated for until the next, you know, three months later. There's some sort of a, they need to go check out something with the doctor. Are you going to tell me, Matt, that in that moment that the, the wedding isn't actually official until three months later? And so there's a, this question of like, at what point? Is it the declaring, the believing, the confessing, the repenting, the being baptized? Which part of this makes it official? What's the mode of salvation? It's all, in, in a way, a little bit of all of it. Let me explain what I mean by this. You know, in, in a marriage situation, when a husband and wife consummate their marriage, when two bodies become one flesh. Can we all agree there's something otherworldly, something supernatural about that moment? There's something that we can't explain in the natural world where two people become one flesh in the consummation of a marriage. There's something special about that that can't be described with words. In the same way, the Bible oftentimes says that when somebody gets into the waters of baptism, there's something uh, supernatural about the experience of being baptized that we can't put into words. In fact, let me, let me read to you uh, the church's official position on, on baptism for just a moment. Here's what we wrote. The human mind explaining baptism is like a harmonica interpreting Beethoven. The music is too majestic for the instrument. No scholar or saint can fully appreciate this moment, what this moment means in heaven. Any words on, bapti on baptism, including these, must be seen as human efforts to understand a holy event. Our danger is to swing to one of two extremes. We make baptism either too important or too unimportant. Either we deify it or we trivialize it. One can see baptism as the essence of the gospel or as irrelevant to the gospel. Both sides are equally perilous. One person says, I am saved because I was baptized. And the other says, I am saved so I don't need to be baptized. The right response is somewhere between these two viewpoints. Again, that's a church position. Let me explain what this means. I think when you look at all these verbs, whether it's repent, believe, confess, turn, be baptized, all of these different uh, things that Scripture points at, they, there's something that they all have in common. And it's a thing called faith. There's an element of faith. There's an element, just like in a marriage, there's an element of love that, that ties all these actions together. 
there's this element of, of, a, of a promise uh, of lifelong love and relationship, this, this faith promise that we enter into. It's, it's in faith that we confess with our mouth. It's in faith that we believe. It's in faith that we turn from our sins and repent from our sins. It's in faith that we take that initial step of obedience and baptism. Now listen, if you just decided to make a decision to follow Jesus right now, you had faith in your heart that Jesus is the Lord of your life, and then you walk out of this building and you get smashed by a bus on your way out. And some, some people would say, but, but you didn't consummate the marriage in the baptistry. I'd say, you know what? They had faith. They're my brother and sister in Christ. Now, does that mean there's not something supernatural that happens in some of these other steps of, is there something special about the kiss? Is there something special about the declaration? Is there something special about people clapping and celebrating you as you walk into the reception hall? Is there something special about consummating your marriage later that night? There is something supernatural and special in all of that. But the thing that ties it all together is faith in Jesus. And so, when asked, hey, what, what is the, the mode of salvation? What must I do to be saved? I think the Bible is really clear. Let me, let me read a verse. Ephesians 2 says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. Now, this version of the Bible I'm reading from uses the word believed, but in most versions of the Bible, a better translation of this is God saved you by his grace when you had faith. Faith is the mode of salvation. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it, for we are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Faith is that thing that you need to, to step into to enter into this saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Is a declaration of that publicly important? Yeah, you should do that. Is symbolizing that and taking the initial step of obedience and, and all the supernatural things I can't even explain that happened in heaven the moment you're baptized, should you do that? Absolutely. In fact, I'd be worried if you said, I want to follow Jesus, but I don't want to be obedient in baptism. Be like, hey, you really want to be obedient and follow Jesus? You should do that. Let me talk about our fourth point is our response to salvation. Once you recognize the need and you recognize that Jesus is the means by which you can be saved, the substitution, and then you recognize the mode, you've placed your faith in Jesus and, 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 and taken these, these, this, this beautiful process of entering into the saving relationship with Jesus, what is our response? And the Bible says that at salvation, you become a new person, that your old self dies and that you become new, that you get, in fact, I love how Galatians 3.27 puts it. It says, and all who have been unified with Christ in baptism have put on Christ, like putting on new clothes. Have you ever noticed that anytime you walk around on December 26th, everyone's walking around confidently in their new fit, right? They're like, I got new shoes, I got new pants, I got a new shirt, I got new underwear. I mean, when you put on new clothes, there's just something about how confident you kind of march into a room. I get new clothes like before Easter Sunday services and before Christmas Eve services. So I can step up on this platform and have just a little bit more confidence on those big days. There's something about that, right? Having new clothes. The Bible says that when you give your life to Jesus and you're saved, it's like putting on a brand new wardrobe. And I think our wardrobe is really kind of made up of, of, of four parts. Before I talk about that, Colossians 2 says, for you were buried with Christ when you were baptized. And with him, you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. I love the symbolism of baptism because it says you are buried with Christ in baptism. When you go down into the water of baptism, under the water, it's like saying to your old self, just like Jesus died and he was put into a tomb, he was put into the earth, your body is put down into the water, you're dying to your old self, and then you're being brought back up out of the water into newness of life. There's something supernatural about baptism. And when you have these new clothes, 
I think the new clothes kind of look like this. A new relationship, a new responsibility, and a new reliance. My three R's. Let me show these to you real quick because I got 43 seconds left. John 10 talks about our new relationship. It says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me. You see, when you enter into a saving relationship with Jesus, you start a new relationship. Isn't that a beautiful thing? This new relationship, it says that the sheep listen to my voice. You learn the voice of God as your shepherd. You tune your ear to what he's saying and you start this relationship of following him. How about this? A new responsibility. 2 Corinthians 5. So since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. You see, we have two major responsibilities as saved people. The moment you're saved, your first responsibility according to this is simply put that you receive this new life and that you're no longer going to live for yourself. You now are, have a responsibility to pursue righteousness and to avoid sin. And another responsibility you have in this is simply to tell other people who are outside of a relationship with Jesus about how Jesus can change their life too. We call that the Great Commission. And then the, the third bit of new clothes that we get to put on is this new reliance. In 1 Corinthians 15, it says, For sin is the sting that results in death. And the law gives sin its power. But thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. You now don't have to rely on your own rap sheet. You get to rely on Jesus' saving grace to carry you through. So what now, church? What do we do with this? I want to give you two things to consider. If you're in this room and you've already swapped out your rap sheet, you're already sitting on Jesus' blank sheet. That's the one that you get to present in heaven one day. That's the one that's going to get you in. It's going to meet the requirements for admission. If you've already made that decision, I, my question for you is who's one person in your life that's still holding on to their own rap sheet that needs to hear this good news, that needs the hope and the joy and the love that you found in Jesus. I want you to write that name down and sometime this week, I want you to go out to coffee with them, take them out to lunch, go on a walk, call them up on the phone. I don't care how you do it, but would you share the love that you found in Jesus with someone who needs to hear it? It's a new responsibility that you have. Now, if you're in this room and you've never swapped out your rap sheet for Jesus, you still have your own set of sin you're hanging on to, your own burdens, and one day you're going to be stuck on the wrong side of the ravine, unable to stand in God's presence because you got sin that you're choosing right, you're choosing right now to pay for, I want to ask you, would today be the day that you say, I want to take out everything in my rap sheet. I want to get, give it to Jesus. I don't want that burden on me anymore. And I'll take, gladly take the perfection of Jesus and put it in my folder. If that's you today, what I'm going to do, I'm going to pray in just a moment. And I want to give you an opportunity to respond to that. As soon as we dismiss, I'm going to come stand right here in the front of the stage. And if you would like to, you know, to, to confess with your mouth and faith that Jesus is the Lord of your life, and you want to swap, make that great substitution, will you come see me? I'll, I'll walk you through those initial steps. I'll help you make that declaration publicly. I'll help you know what to do next so you can make that substitution. And maybe you're in this room and you've already decided to place your faith in Jesus, but you haven't taken that initial step of obedience and baptism. If that's you as well, I want you to come see me right after service and say, I need to get baptized today. I'm, I'm, I'm tired of being disobedient in that way. Let's do it. And you know what we can do? We can schedule your baptism for next week. We can get you baptized at the beginning of next service. 
We already had a baptism at the beginning of first service. I think we've got another baptism coming next service. Maybe you need to be in that mix. All right, let's pray together. God, right now I pray for everyone in this room. We all have something we need to do. For my brothers and sisters in Christ who have been baptized, would you allow them to have a, a, a name right now of someone that they are supposed to share the good news of, of, of the work you've done for us on the cross? Would you give them that name? Would you give them the courage this week to share that good news with that person? God, for those in this room who've already made that step of faith, but they've been disobedient in, in taking that initial step of obedience and baptism, would you allow them to take that step of courage today to, to get a baptism scheduled either for today or for next week? God, for those in this room who've never started that relationship with you, would you give them the courage? Would you remove any blindness from their eyes that the evil one is has kept there? Would you remove that, that blinding and let them see the light for the first time? Give them the courage to come and start a new life with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow. We are so thankful for the truth that was shared in the message today. Please know that we as a church are praying that what you have learned today and the truths that God has put deep into your heart will manifest and grow into something amazing. You can experience that with other believers at ACC on Sunday mornings at 710 Aqua Heart Road. And remember, you belong at ACC.